Sony has announced the A7S III. Long anticipated, people have been waiting for this camera for a long, long time, and rightfully so. It's got some really cool features that have been lacking from the A7S Mark II. There have been other A7 cameras, but the A7S Mark II is one of those just like perfect for video, for the people who shoot with it. And really there's just a, those, those few extra features that a, a version three, um, people were just fingers crossed, hoping that Sony would bring. And thankfully they have. I'm sure there's plenty of videos out there talking about the specs. And of course you can look that up. We'll go through it even a little bit. Um, but just right off the gate, I am a GH5 shooter as well as an Ursa mini shooter. Um, GH4 uh, was kind of like my first 4K camera. So that's where I come from. I don't shoot with an A7. Um, I have in the past as like kind of rentals, I've tested them out. I have a couple friends that shoot with the A7 uh, Sony cameras. So I don't hold them kind of like, I don't, I don't hate them, um, but I also don't love them. I'm not like a, a fan. I'm just like, I've had the A7S II and I've just been waiting for the three. If that's you, you probably already know you want this camera and you want to buy it. Maybe for people on the fence who are looking to upgrade, maybe looking to switch from something else. That's kind of where I come into this and I feel like maybe my perspective is valuable coming from a GH5, which is micro four thirds. And of course we all want to, we all want to shoot full frame. So with the Sony doing that and a mirror body that's relatively affordable, it's a very attractive camera. So we can talk about what the A7S III brings new to the table and talk about if it's really worth the upgrade, if it's worth the switch, uh, kind of what we think. And I'll share some of my thoughts on that. So if we want to take a look at the Sony A7S Mark III, we can go through here. And it's a really cool landing page they have here on BNH where um, they've kind of done some I don't know, how do, how do you describe this? It's like custom layout that they've added to B&H, which is kind of nice that they do this per camera, but it can also make just getting down to the specs kind of annoying as well. But here they have a nice comparison between the A7S III versus the other A7 cameras, or at least the A7S Mark II and the A7 III. Um, the big feature with the A7S Mark III is that you can shoot 4K at 120 frames a second. Is that valuable? Yes, absolutely. Um, is it the resolution you know, killer like that Canon and Blackmagic and a few other uh, camera companies are bringing to the table? No, it's still just 4K, but honestly, when most of us talk about video resolution and we're talking about this stuff, 4K is usually good enough um, for modern context, right? If you want a future proof and you're worried about a, a, a future where 8K becomes a norm for whatever reason, even though 4K hasn't really been adopted as a viewing uh, medium, like we, we can have those debates, but 4K across the board is good. It's not 1080, which in today's day and age, if this was a 1080p camera, like I think everyone would just laugh, right? Um, but it's not, you know, bringing any resolution, uh, extra bells and whistles there. It's bringing the frame rate, which 4K 120 is great. I mean, the Ursa Mini uh, Pro Gen 2 does 4K 120, which is beautiful. Um, and having that feature in your camera and something that's like available, you know, doesn't really fit in your pocket with a lens, but like, let's say it's pocketable, the A7S III, um, really, really valuable. Um, it's got the internal image stabilization. Sony has thankfully fixed their terrible screen design for the longest time. It was one of my biggest hangups with the Sony cameras was just the screen wouldn't flip all the way around. Uh, they fixed that. So now they have a proper articulating screen, screen like, almost everybody else has. Um, so all that's great. Basically, I think Sony's kind of looked at the market, looked at what other companies are doing, look at what people want, and kind of made a really nice hybrid camera um, that can kind of do everything you would want. Uh, you don't have to shoot 4K 120 by any means. You can also do 4K 60 if you want. Um, but it's it's a it's a good all-around camera. The one thing I might criticize it for is, is oddly enough, is that it's only 12 megapixels resolution. So if you are looking for a true hybrid, um, don't expect a lot in the photography department with this one. You're not gonna have those uh, you know, beautiful resolutions to work with for uh, portrait photography or landscapes or prints that you might have with some of the other A7 cameras like the A7R that's gonna give you tons of resolution. Granted, the A7S is specifically meant for video and that's what this is in mind. But if you do like a camera that can do a little bit of both, um, I do think it would have been nice to upgrade the you know photography side. But to be fair, the A7S is meant to do really well in the low light. And so having larger photo sites allows the camera to kind of see in the dark, as they say, and do better at higher ISOs. Now, 
I wouldn't look at this though as like the main feature. I've talked about that this in the past uh, about the A7S cameras in that shooting in low light is valuable in certain situations, but most of the time for good looking images, you want there to be some light. Light is how you see and shape your image where there's light, where there isn't light. This right now is being lit to look a certain way. If you go into any environment and you just shoot and it's low light, you might have to in certain situations if you're shooting a documentary or something like that where you just don't, you're, you're run and gun, you, ha you can only bring the camera with you, you can't bring lights, you can't do anything. Totally valid. You want something that can do well in low light. But if you're looking for the most cinematic images, the most film-like images, most of, the, most of the time those aren't gonna be low light uh, situations. You're going to want some kind of light to kind of shape and help your image. Now, is it helpful that you don't need as much light, as much power? Yeah, that's helpful. But a lot of times you're going to be shooting in daylight as well where you have full sun and it's not a problem. So I look at the low light thing as like it's a nice feature, but it's not necessarily for me a must have, which is why with like the GH4 and the GH5, I went that route compared to Sony because those cameras were much more video centric at the time and really helpful in having all those great video features like the flip screen, like continuous recording, like not overheating, like a long battery life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now Sony, in, from my perspective, has finally brought to the table a full frame mirrorless camera that suits almost all of those needs. And what's great about that is that Sony's finally done it, which is awesome and I applaud them for it. Is it enough to get people to switch? Me personally, probably not. I don't think I'm gonna give up all of my lenses, all of my kit for something that, you know, it does shoot slightly higher frame rate, so I can do 4K 120, better low light. But on the flip side, you know, I'm, I'm eagerly anticipating a GH6, the follow-up to S1H, the Lumix S1H, finally, when they did, they went full frame. And they have that. So like, I look at the Sony as a really good option, as a cho as a great choice if you have a bunch of Sony lenses already, but is it enough to get me to switch or to move for a lot of people? I don't know. I'd be curious to know what you think um, based on your own personal habits in shooting. I think it is finally great that Sony shooters actually get a proper video camera in their kind of hybrid mirrorless DSLR kind of camera. A lot of people say, well, you don't need these features or there's workarounds, but like at the end of the day, you usually want the most streamlined, smooth experience possible. One camera that you don't always have to rig out. You can if you want to, but you don't have to rely on external batteries and external adapters and like all this stuff to make it work, like a fan to cool it down. All that stuff is really, really annoying. And it's just nice to have something that just works right out of the box. And I think that's finally what we have with the A7S III. So I applaud Sony. I think it's gonna be a great camera. They do say that you can record 4K60 for over an hour without overheating. But that makes me wonder that like, can you not go longer than that? Like, I, it's so mind boggling to me that these camera manufacturers are making cameras that like, yeah, you can do it, but it overheats. Now granted, you probably will never run into that situation with Sony, at least hopefully only real world testing will kind of let you know that, you know, so maybe if you're cautious and you've had overheating issues with Sony cameras in the past, maybe give it a rental before you actually go out and buy it. But for me, the GH cameras, granted they're a smaller sensor, but like they never overheat. And like I shoot in Phoenix, in the desert it's like incredibly hot and like i've never once had it overheat heat on me so it's so weird to have you know these cameras that like have all these great features but like you can't hardly use them because they overheat that's a separate that's more pegged towards canon than sony but they do but sony does mention it um there's some other features that you should know about on the sony a7s mark iii that it can do 10 bit 422 um, it can do raw 16 bit over hdmi if that's of interest to you most of the time with the you know, fancier codecs, often they end up becoming really cumbersome in uh, like an H.264 or even H.265 um, encoder. Like editing that footage is not nearly as fun, and maybe that sounds weird, but it's really fun to edit ProRes. Um, when you're shooting with the Ursa Mini, it just, it just edits smoothlessly, like flawlessly, like there's no 
uh, chug or delay. You get that a little bit on the GH5, not quite as bad as I've had it with some other, like H265 specifically, you know, depending on your setup, depending on your computer, depending on what you're editing with, like you just have to be cautious. Like a, a, a codec can sound really nice and like, oh, won't it be great when I can do 10 bit 422 and it's 4K and it's 120 frames, like that's, it sounds great and then in practice when you go to edit it, it can be really annoying because it can slow your machine down and you might have to make proxies and it can slow down your workflow and you may not be getting, depending on how you color correct and how you edit projects, you may not be getting the full benefits. So it is something to like look at as a nice feature, even raw file sizes are gonna be a lot larger. So if you're used to like, you know, 8-bit 420 and then going to 16-bit raw, 120 frames, 4K, uh, like you're gonna, it may overwhelm you, your hard drives, your setup. So all of the, the features on paper that, you know, even with like what Canon is doing with the 8K or Ursa Mini with the 12K, like these things sound really nice, but then in practice they can become overwhelming. Thankfully 4K, you know, what used to be that way for 4K, hard drives and everything has gotten a lot cheaper, things have gotten faster, computers have gotten better. So like stuff always catches up, but it usually seems that on the acquisition side, it's usually kind of the cutting edge. And then you kind of have to work through that workflow to find a way to make it work for you. And it's certainly better than it used to be where you had to log and transfer and you had to make everything ProRes, like otherwise it wouldn't play at all. Like, but there is something to be said about just being able to shoot ProRes. Um, the fact that it just is so sturdy and reliable and just a good efficient codec for editing is really, really nice. And I, I appreciate any time I'm, I'm editing Ursa Mini footage compared to something that comes from more of like a hybrid mirrorless camera because it just edits smoother and better. So also something to keep in mind as you look at the specs on the A7S Mark III, it does have the internal stabilization. It's not quite as good as some other cameras. I think it's like five and a half stops of stabilization combine that with a lens, maybe you'll get a little bit better. Um, but really, I think it's just, Sony has done a really good job rounding out this camera and kind of adding the features that we're desperately missing. The battery life is supposedly better. I believe it's 60% better. Whatever that means in practice, we'll see, considering you're shooting you know, a faster frame right now. So it's all kind of like just numbers on paper until you actually try it out. But upgrade the battery life, better performance there. They've got the flip screen, finally, thank goodness and they're actually offering some decent codecs and some nicer frame rate options considering the A7S II, you were capped out at 4K 30. So to go from 4K 30 to 4K 120, I'm sure if you're an A7S shooter, like you're happily upgrade. The price is 3,500 bucks, um, which isn't unreasonable uh, for what you get. It's actually probably a pretty good deal, all things considered, but that is a hefty investment if you don't have any Sony glass and this is like something brand new. You're gonna have to invest a lot in fast memory cards and lenses, batteries, like it's it's an undertaking. But I do think it is a great option for people out there who are looking for more um, features in, the, in their camera set. If you've been shooting with the A7S Mark II and you've only been able to do 4K 30 and you haven't been able to do any slow motion in 4K, that's really, really frustrating. Meanwhile, people with the GH5 have been doing 4K 60 for what has it been? I don't know, a long time now, three or four years, whatever it's been. So to finally have that uh, feature is, I think, very, very welcome and good to have in the marketplace. And competition is always good. At the end of the day, that's, that's the best thing, is that Canon has new stuff, Sony has new stuff, Blackmagic has new stuff, Panasonic with Lumix is gonna have new stuff. Nikon, who cares? It doesn't usually matter or factor into this. Red is always doing new stuff. So it's just great to finally see this stuff become these, these high-end premium features that have been relatively expensive trickle down and kind of become more mainstream in consumer, prosumer products like the A7S uh, III. And it's just finally good to be out there. I've been sick of the rumors and, and hearing about this camera and people constantly talking about when's it coming? When's it coming? When's it coming? It's like, all right, it's finally here. Now we can now we can worry about the version four that's inevitably coming later. So um, glad that it's there. Glad it's an option, and I probably won't personally be buying it, but maybe it's right for you.